to that question, I want to share this story with you. Um, a gentleman that was president of a health care system in the state of Georgia told this story. He said once when he worked in, in a certain hospital, uh, a patient there knocked over a cup of water and it spilled on the floor beside the patient's bed. Well, the patient was afraid they might slip if they got out of bed, so they asked the nurse's aide to mop it up. What the patient didn't know was that the po hospital had a policy. Small spills were to be cleaned up by the nurse's aide. Large spills were to be mopped up by housekeeping. The nurse's aide decided the spill was a large one and called housekeeping. Well, <clears throat> housekeeper arrived and they declared it was a small spill. You see where this is going, right? An argument followed. Well, it's not my responsibility, said the nurse's aide, because it's a large puddle. And the housekeeper didn't agree. Well, it's not mine, it's too small. Listening to this go on for a few moments, the patient had had enough. He took the picture of water and threw the whole thing in the floor. <laughs> and then he asked this question. He says, is that big enough for y'all to decide now? Oh, man. <clears throat> well, that was the end of the argument. And the point of that is this. When it comes to knowing the responsibilities of an elder, the Bible's clear. We don't have to argue about it. We don't have to guess. The Bible is clear. So if you'll have your Bibles, turn to 1 Peter chapter 5. I'm going to go to this text because it captures the essence, and it's the... It's a short, brief text, so we're going to go there. 1 Peter 5, verses 1 through 4. Peter says, I exhort the elders among you as a fellow elder and witness to the sufferings of Christ, as well as one who shares in the glory about to be revealed. Shepherd God's flock among you, not overseeing out of compulsion, but willingly, as God would have you, not out of greed for money, but eagerly, not lording it over those entrusted to you, but being examples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the unfading crown of glory. Um, I have noticed that there's three aspects to a uh, job description, if you will. I call it the three R's. The first R is requirements. It's the, it's the minimum expectation. You know, we, we're not going to look at anybody unless they have these you know, kinds of qualifications. Well, the requirements uh, of an elder are for them to be an example to the flock. And it says that in verse 3 of Peter there, being examples to the flock. The next thing you need to understand about a job is the role. What's the role of this particular uh, position. Well, the role here of an elder is to be an overseer. Um, it says to not oversee out of compulsion, but willingly as God would have you. And so uh, that means to lead. And then, of course, the, the third R is the responsibilities. What specific things are you to do? And that would be to shepherd God's flock there in First Peter 5 verse 2. Shepherd God's flock among you. And another word for shepherd would be pastor, to, to care for the flock like a shepherd would. Well, let's look tonight at what does an elder do. And I submit to you that there are four things. Now, I'll say this. As I was studying this, I found more than four things. And I began to look at other resources and stuff out there, and I found an, an outline in a book that had four things. And I went, you know, I'm going to use that outline because everything that I'm looking at will fit one of those areas. And I think that a simple outline is always the best outline. So I'm going to give you four responsibilities of an elder. What do they do? Number one, teach. Teach. I'm going to look at different passages here that talk about elders, so I might move fast, but let's look at them. 1 Timothy chapter 3, it says, An overseer, therefore, must be above reproach, the husband of one wife, self-controlled, sensible, respectable, hospitable, able to teach. Okay. Now, we've already established that elder, uh, overseer, bishop, uh, pastor, those terms are used interchangeably in the New Testament. And so when it's talking about an overseer here in 1 Timothy 3, it's talking about an elder. And it says they must be 
able to teach. That is one of the requirements they're expected to do. Now, in Titus chapter 1, when Paul told uh, Titus to appoint elders in every uh, town there on the island of Crete, he says that they are to, Titus 1 verse 9, they are to hold to the faithful messages taught so that he will be able to both encourage with sound teaching and to refute those who contradict it. So again, an elder has to be skilled in handling the Word of God. Uh, 1 Timothy 5.17 says, The elders who are good leaders are to be considered worthy of double honor, especially those who work hard at preaching and teaching. Uh, If there are multiple Elders in every church, which that's what happened in the book of Acts, Acts 14, verse 23, and also there in Titus chapter 1, uh, you will find that historically, usually there's one that is gifted and uh, the church supports them financially, like, like myself, so that they can give themselves to the study of the Word of God. And that's what 1 Timothy 5, 17 is talking about. And then in uh, Paul's follow-up letter to Timothy, in 2 Timothy 2, verse 2, Paul says, What you've heard from me in the presence of many witnesses, commit to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. Okay? Now, um, I've always used that verse in a disciple-making context, and it certainly fits that. But... Uh, As I'm reading this with fresh eyes, notice he says, faithful men who will be able to teach. There's that phrase, able to teach. It was mentioned in 1 Timothy 3, describing overseer elders, and now here it is in 2 Timothy 2. Uh, We always need to be looking for godly men that are able to teach. Now, let's kind of apply this for a minute. You see, an elder has to be able to teach God's Word. That can look Uh, That can look differently depending on the man and his gift. Uh, He could be a a Sunday school class, a teacher of a Sunday school class. He could be leading a Bible study. He could be leading a D group. He could be mentoring one or two uh, individually. Uh, He could be doing pulpit supply when the pastor is absent or so forth. So uh, different different ways that can be expressed because they're, they're teaching God's Word. Now, I love... Uh, There's a great book out there by Lynn Anderson about elders, and the name of the book is called They Smell Like Sheep, which is great. I love that title. And uh, I'm going to use some of his quotes. And one quote I'm going to use tonight is this, and I I think he's got a point here. He says, The man who is experienced with the Word of God has assimilated the Bible into his life so that his teaching serves up life resources and strength to others. This teacher will not only be at home with the Bible, but at home with sharing it with his flock. He is one who stands regularly in the midst of people with his open Bible in his hand. He understands their needs and feelings, and he's able to connect the scriptures with real life issues. The important question is not, can he teach a class? The real question is, does he teach? Now let me say that last line again. The important question is not, can he teach a class? The real question is, does he teach? Because an elder is someone that can skillfully handle the Word of God, and as he begins to interact with others, whether it's in a a Bible study setting, a classroom setting, or a a larger setting like this, or more personal, smaller, intimate setting, or one-on-one setting, they are able to take... The, the scriptures, and apply them to the issues of life, okay? It's not about having the answer to everything. It's not about being a knowledge expert. It's simply being able to take the Word of God and apply it to the issues of life. So that is the first thing that an elder must do. He must be able to teach. There's a second thing, and that is to lead. A second thing that uh, an elder does is he leads, uh, let's go to Acts chapter 20. You know, in Acts chapter 20, we have, uh, we have it documented where Paul met with the elders from the church at Ephesus, and he saw them for the very last time. And uh, it's a great passage of Scripture. I just want to zero in on one verse, and that is Acts 20 verse 28, where Paul told the men, "'Be on guard for yourselves.'" 
and for all the flock of which the Holy Spirit has appointed you as overseers to shepherd the church of God, which he purchased with his own blood. Now that passage, or that verse, excuse me, is so rich. He's saying that um, the Holy Spirit has appointed you as overseers of the flock, and you are to shepherd the church of God. In other words, whose church is it? It's not mine, it's not yours, it's his, because he purchased the church with his own blood. Um, So we know who the chief shepherd is. We know who the great shepherd is. We know who the good shepherd is who lays down his life for the sheep, and that's Jesus. Well, then you jump to 1 Timothy 3, verse 1. Paul said, this saying is trustworthy. If anyone aspires to be an overseer, he desires a noble work. Well, absolutely. If God puts the desire in your heart and you feel called to do it, you've got to realize that you're going to have to depend on God to fulfill that calling, uh, that he's the one that does the appointing. He's the one that does the calling. He's the one that commands us to shepherd, to lead, and to teach. And the church is not ours. It's his because he purchased it with his own blood. In Titus chapter 1, going back to where Paul told Titus what to do on the island of Crete, he says in Titus 1 verse 7, as an overseer of God's household. Notice notice right there, he's reminding us that you may be an overseer, but it's God's household, okay? It's the family of God. The church belongs to him. And then you have Hebrews uh, 13, but let me back up for a minute. So I pointed to that statement in Titus 1, an overseer of God's household, because that's to remind elders, pastors, overseers that the church belongs to to the Lord, not, not to any man or group of leaders. But then it's also healthy for the church to look at how does that affect them. In Hebrews 13, verse 17, it says, Obey your leaders and submit to them, since they keep watch over your souls as those who will give an account, so that they can do this with joy and not with grief, for that would be unprofitable for you. So, you know, leaders have a huge responsibility. They're going to have to give an account someday. And so that's that. So let's apply this for a minute. Now here's where I want to take a few moments. When it comes to... Being a leader in the church as an elder, what does that look like? What does that mean? Well, I think, uh, I think I can boil it down to three main areas where they lead. And this is, uh, this is where I was able to fit this right into the leadership aspect of the outline. Uh, the first thing that elders do to lead the flock is they lead by direction. In other words, their, their chief aim should be, Lord, what do you want to do? And they seek the Lord's will. They, they, they study the scriptures. They, they, they pray. They seek the mind of the Lord to discern, Lord, what is your will in this situation? Lord, what is your will for uh, this congregation at, during this season? What is it you want us to do? Uh, so the direction issue is not, well, I'm just going to make something up and that's what we're going to go with. It's more of seeking God to discern what he's leading us to do and sharing that with everyone else, pointing to him. Uh, the, the second D when it comes to leading uh, the flock is doctrine. Now this ties back to the first responsibility. An elder must be able to teach, must be able to teach sound doctrine and refute those who oppose it. Uh, so an, an elder leads by teaching the word of God and then refuting false doctrine, okay? That doesn't mean you got to be the uh, police on Scripture or anything like that, but it simply means that when something is being taught that's not right, well, then you've got to take a stand on that. I know one time in a, in a church, a uh, pastor had to deal with a situation when uh, certain parents were teaching youth, And a subject came up on dating, and they're like, oh, you should just do whatever you think you should do, da-da-da-da-da. And all of a sudden, it's like, whoa, wait a minute. God's Word tells us to live a certain way. We need to do this. We need to do that. And so when it comes to matters of doctrine, it matters what's taught. It matters that we 
teach what Scripture says. We don't uh, add to it. We don't take anything from it. We simply point to what the Scripture says. And so doctrine is very important. And the third D when it comes to elders leading the flock is discipline. Now, I must confess that as I was wrestling over this series and whether or not the Lord was leading me to teach this series, I began to wrestle with an issue. And I don't mind being honest with you about that right now. Uh, Gordon and I have talked about this for a long time. We need more deacons, right? And uh, we have spent the last couple years, anyway, uh, looking at, uh, you know, getting more deacons. And uh, to make a long story short, I've come to the conclusion that a lot of younger men are shy about it because they either don't understand it or they've seen everything that deacons have done in the past and they're like, no. And so as I began to go to the Word of God and say, God, this is a Bible issue. Like deacons are in the Bible, pastors are in the Bible. Church is in the Bible. Leading in the church is in the Bible. Forget everything else. What does the Scripture say? And the more I began to pray about it, the more I began to wrestle, I felt like the Holy Spirit was saying, Corey, you know what the Word says. Well, yeah. Well, you know what the Word says. Well, yeah. Well, what if they don't agree or what if they don't accept it or what if they don't understand it? Corey, you know what the Word says. Yes, sir, Lord. So ultimately, you know, in my preaching and teaching ministry, when I seek the Lord about what he wants me to teach, what he wants me to preach, ultimately I have to go, yes, sir, Lord. And so I want to tell you what the word says. When it comes to discipline matters in the New Testament, in the New Testament church specifically, it's the elders that deal with that. You know, if you go back all the way to Acts 6, many believe that deacons had their origin in Acts chapter 6. Uh, I'll tell you the story real quick. In Acts chapter 6, a lot had happened between Acts chapter 2 and Acts chapter 6. In Acts chapter 2, the day of Pentecost showed up and the Holy Spirit came and Peter boldly preached the gospel and 3,000 people were saved in one day and the church just exploded. Think about it. The church went from a congregation of about 120 people in an upper room to 3,000 just like that. And by our standards today, that's a mega church. 3,000 believers in one place. Just like that. They began to meet daily and they began to meet in each other's homes and they began to grow and grow and grow as the Lord began to add more and more and more and there were more ministry opportunities. There were many widows to take care of and, and it ultimately it got to the point where it came to a head. There were a lot of widows that didn't have anybody to take care of them and the church stepped in and did that and some of them spoke Hebrew and some of them did not. And one day, the Greek-speaking widow said, Hey, we're getting overlooked. We're getting left out. You know, when we, when we go to the church, if you will, to, to get some help, it ain't there. And all of a sudden, a divisive situation was right there on their doorstep. A crisis was right there in front of them. And the apostles said, it's not right for us to serve and wait tables when God's called us to preach the word and pray, the ministry of the word and prayer. And although it was the apostles that handled that, when the apostles were removed from the scene, I believe that mantle of responsibility when it comes to the word of God and prayer falls on the elders. Because when you go to Acts chapter 15, you have the Jerusalem council and the history of the early church where Paul and Barnabas and a group from Antioch, they went to Jerusalem to settle the issue. Um, do you have to be circumcised to be saved? In other words, once these Gentile men hear the gospel and believe, do they have to follow the law of Moses? And uh, there was a group that said they have to follow the law of Moses. They have to be circumcised or they're not saved. 
And Paul and Barnabas obviously said, that's not the gospel. That's not what it says. And so the apostles together with the elders in Acts chapter 15 met with Peter and and James and Paul and Barnabas. And out of that discussion, out of that meeting, They beautifully handled the direction of where God was leading them. They beautifully handled the issue of doctrine about saved by grace through faith, and, and that's it. And they beautifully handled how to handle discipline moving forward. Uh, I think we have gotten away. uh, When you look at history, there's a couple of books that uh, have affected Southern Baptists for the past hundred years. And it, it, it was a dichotomy of the, the pastor is the spiritual leader and the deacons are the business leader. And all I will say is, how's that working for you? Uh, when it comes down to it, I believe that biblically, elders are called to do one thing and deacons are called to do another. What has hurt Southern Baptists as a whole is short pastoral tenures. Y'all know this. Those of you that have been around for a long time, y'all know what I'm going to say. You've been here long enough to see this pastor and that pastor and this pastor and that pastor, and when that happens, a lot falls on deacons, whether you like it or not, right? But when it comes to the Word of God and what it teaches, when we both know what we're called to do and we do it and we work together It's beautiful how God has designed his church to function. And so elders lead the flock by seeking the Lord's direction, by teaching uh, sound doctrine and refuting those who oppose it, and by leading the church in discipline. Okay, And that doesn't mean they're the sheriffs, that doesn't mean they're the cops, that doesn't mean they're the police. It just simply means that when there is an issue in the church, The most mature spiritually men who are skilled at taking the word of God and applying it to the issues of life, they lead the way in dealing with issues of discipline. Okay? All right. So the goal of leadership ultimately, in my mind, is Ephesians 4, 11 through 13. And I'll just read that and let Scripture speak for itself. And the Lord gave some to be apostles some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers. Why? To equip the saints for the work of ministry. Why? To build up the body of Christ. So, until we all reach unity in the faith and the knowledge of God's Son, growing into maturity with a stature measured by Christ's fullness. Ultimately, God wants to use all of the leaders in His church to equip his people to be the hands and feet of Jesus so that we build one another up in love, we exercise our gifts, we serve one another, and we reach unity in the faith and knowledge of the Son, and we grow in maturity, and we experience the fullness of Christ. That's good. Well, when it comes to leading in the church... Again, Lynn Anderson, they smell like sheep, has this quote. He says, The authority of an elder is not of position, but of moral suasion. Now, let me put that in my own terms. Just because a man is an elder doesn't mean he walks around with a badge or a cape and say, I'm in charge. It doesn't work that way. Um, The authority of an elder flows from two things. An open Bible and an obedient life. Does that make sense? An open Bible and an obedient life. The open Bible represents, here's what God says. The obedient life means I'm an example. That's why Paul told young Timothy in 1 Timothy 4, until I come, give your attention to public reading, exhortation, and teaching. And when he said public reading, he was referring to public reading of Scripture, exhortation from the Scripture, and the teaching of the Scripture. Don't neglect the gift that is in you. 
It was given to you through prophecy with the laying on of hands by the council of elders. There's that again, 1 Timothy 4.14, a council of elders. Practice these things. Be committed to them so that your progress may be evident to all. Pay close attention to your life and your teaching. Persevere in these things, for in doing this you will save both yourself and your hearers. And so when it comes to... The, the, the man, the leader, the elder, he is to discharge the duties of his ministry. He is to put things into practice and watch his own progress so that after doing so, he not only saves others by sharing the word of God and God works through that, but saving himself by making sure he's applying the same things that he teaches and preaches. Now, let me say this. That's why 1 Thessalonians 5.12 says, We ask you, brothers and sisters, to give recognition to those who labor among you and lead you in the Lord and admonish you and to regard them very highly in love because of their work. Be at peace among yourselves. All right, so we've covered two of four. Two things that an elder does. They teach. They must be able to teach the Word of God. They lead in matters of um, direction, doctrine, and discipline. And number three, they model. I still remember years ago. Boy, this goes back. He's, he's on TV still, Charles Barkley, right? But I remember years ago when he was a young player in the NBA, he did some stuff he probably wasn't proud of. They called him out and he said, I ain't a role model. You know, a lot of us are role models whether we like it or not. Okay, somebody, somebody is looking up to us. Somebody is watching the life we live, and they're noticing the example that we set. When it comes to leaders in the church, we are models, whether we like it or not. First Peter 5.3 tells us not to lord our leadership over those entrusted to us, but be examples to the flock. Uh, no wonder Paul told the church at Corinth in 1 Corinthians 11.1, 1, he said, imitate me as I also imitate Christ. Uh, I love what Rick Warren said about that years ago. He said, the first time I read that, I thought, man, Paul's coming off cross as arrogant, you know, imitate me and, you know, you know that kind of thing. But he said, the more he read it, he said, that's not, that's not the spirit of what he said at all. Uh, in the real world, in the real world, we learn by watching others. We learn by doing. And so Paul, as a man of God who loves the Lord, who's following Jesus, is able to say, do what I do as I do what Jesus does. Imitate me as I imitate Christ. And that's exactly what he said. No wonder Paul could say to the church in Philippi, especially after being put in jail for preaching the gospel and then sing until midnight and all of a sudden an earthquake and that next thing you know they have a revival in the jail and the jailer comes to him and he leads the jailer to the Lord there in Philippi. No wonder Paul could say to the church in Philippi in Philippians 4, 9, do what you've learned and received and heard from me and seen in me and the God of peace will be with you. That's bold. But he lived his life in such a way that they could go, yep, he's telling it right. And he was. Hebrews 13, 7 reminds us, remember your leaders who have spoken God's word to you as you carefully observe the outcome of their lives. Imitate their faith. Imitate their faith. And so as you look to your leaders that share God's word with you, Observe the outcome of their lives and imitate their faith. You don't have to walk like them and talk like them and dress like them and all of those things, but imitate their faith. Imitate their Christian lifestyle and the example as a believer that they set. Elders are examples to the flock, and particularly, I think, in two very important ways. Elders are examples to the flock, because they model maturity. If we went back and read the qualifications in 1 Timothy 3 and Titus chapter 1, they're to be above reproach. 
They are to live their lives in such a way that people respect them. They're not perfect, but they are mature in Christ. And they model maturity. Oh, how we need examples like that today. But not only do elders model maturity for the flock, they also model ministry to the flock. You know, uh, an, an elder pastor is to be hospitable. And so you are to model ministry. In other words, they learn by seeing. They learn by doing. And so when it comes to being elder, you're an example to the flock by modeling maturity and modeling ministry. I like what Lynn Anderson, his book, They Smell Like Sheep. He says, a shepherd knows each sheep by name. He nurtures the young, bandages the wounded, cares for the weak and protects them all, a shepherd smells like sheep. When you grow in maturity, it can be messy. It involves dealing with the issues of life with other people. When it comes to ministry, it involves dealing with the issues of life with other people. It can be messy, even though it's a great thing. And so at the end of the day, the shepherd smells like the sheep. So there are four responsibilities of an elder. We've talked about teach. We've talked about lead. We've talked about model. And number four is pray. Pray. Going back to Acts chapter 6 where we see kind of a fork in the road when it came to leadership in the church. The apostles were doing everything until they got to a point to where they couldn't do everything. And so they told the congregation, choose seven men among you, full of uh, wisdom, faith, and the Holy Spirit, and then we will set them apart, and they will take care of these widows that are being overlooked. And we, Acts 6 verse 4, we will devote ourselves to prayer and the ministry of the Word. Well, we've already talked about the ministry of the Word. An elder must be able to teach. But now we'll talk about the other side of the coin, and that is prayer. I like what James 5 says. I'm going to read it. It's about prayer, but I don't know if you've ever caught what it's saying. James 5, verse 14. Is anyone among you sick? He should call for the elders of the church. Elders being plural, church being singular. Once you see it in the New Testament... It's, it's there. It's just irrefutable. It's there. He should call for the elders of the church, and they are to pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. The prayer of faith will save the sick, per sick person, and the Lord will raise him up. If he has committed sins, he will be forgiven. Therefore, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another so that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person is very powerful in its effect. That's James 5, 14 through 16. Notice here in this passage, particularly, elders pray for the flock, and there's two kinds of prayers that are specifically mentioned. Uh, one is the prayer of faith. It says that if someone is uh, sick, they come to the elders of the church. They're to pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord, and the prayer of faith will save the sick person, and the Lord will raise him up. Um, that is a prayer of faith. In faith, you're asking God to do what we can't do. He's the great physician. I love the fact that when you read the New Testament, you know who mentions more about the Holy Spirit than anybody in the New Testament? the author of the books in the New Testament. It's not Peter. It's not Peter, but I'll tell you who it's not first. It's not Peter, the one that stood up on the day of Pentecost when the Holy Spirit came, filled with boldness from the Holy Spirit, and saw 3,000 people got, get saved. It's not Peter. I'll give you another hint. It's not Paul. Paul wrote a third of the books in the New Testament. At least, it's not Paul. Well, at this point, you're going, well, my goodness, if it's not Peter and it's not Paul, who is it? 
Dr. Luke. Luke the physician. He wrote the Gospel of Luke, pretty decent length. He wrote the book of Acts, pretty long as far as page count, word count in the New Testament. And he gives us more data, if you will, about the Holy Spirit than anybody else. I think it's because he was a trained physician, and yet he, of all people, or is the one in the New Testament says, let me tell you about the virgin birth. It did happen. And it was because of the Holy Spirit. Let me tell you about how the church was born. It happened because of the Holy Spirit. And I could go on and on and on and on, but we can credit Luke to that. And so this prayer of faith is about physical things, I would say. But then also, notice that there is a prayer of healing. Okay, It says that uh, um, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another so that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person is very powerful in its effect. And many times I've seen this from experience. If someone is struggling spiritually and they want someone to pray for them, they're either going to go to someone that they know real well, they're going to go to a prayer warrior, and we have a few of them, or they will go to a pastor because they know the prayer of a righteous person is very powerful in its effect. And here, when it comes to the prayer of healing it seems to deal with more of the spiritual aspects. You would think prayer of faith would be spiritual and healing would be physical. Maybe James is presenting this in a way to kind of get our attention. But the point is that godly leaders pray. They pray for the church. They pray for God's flock. They pray for the sheep. They pray for the physical concerns. They pray for the spiritual needs. They pray in faith. They pray for healing. They pray that the Lord would work. And when God answers, it's very powerful. And so one last quote from Lynn Anderson. He says, good shepherds lose sleep over the flock. And that's true. There will be times when you experience nighttime like Jesus did. You know, you read the Gospels and there were nights that Jesus went somewhere to pray. Or early in the morning when the... Uh, disciples got up, they couldn't find him because he, he was already up and he was alone and he was praying to his father. There are, there are times when the, the, uh, the responsibilities of, uh, the, the weight of the responsibilities weigh on a leader and they simply have to pray and seek God's face and seek God's hand in the situation. So let's wrap this up. As someone said, maybe we can sum up an elder's job description this way. Shepherd the church like Jesus shepherded his disciples. Just like Jesus, make teaching central to your ministry. Focus on Jesus and the gospel. In every decision, lead your people to know and trust Jesus. Let them see the character of Christ in your own life. And just like Jesus at times would turn aside to pray... So are we to join Jesus in praying for his church. The under-shepherds of Jesus are at their best when they reflect Jesus, the good shepherd who laid down his life for the sheep, the great shepherd who equips them for life, and the chief shepherd who rewards those who are his when he returns. Man, that is good. I want to close with one last thing. I read this verse earlier tonight, but I want to go back to it one last time. Acts chapter 20, when Paul had his farewell speech to the elders from Ephesus, at the same verse, Acts 20, verse 28, he said, Be on guard for yourselves and for all the flock, of which the Holy Spirit has appointed you as overseers, to shepherd the church of God, which he purchased with his own blood. I can remind you that when you read that verse, the church belongs to who? It belongs to God. It's bought and paid for by the blood of Jesus. And he is the one 
The Holy Spirit is the one that appoints and calls men to serve in this way. And so with that said, here's my challenge. It only stands to reason that if that is true, then will you pray for the Holy Spirit to begin to call men to do just that? Men who will teach the Word of God. Men who will lead when it comes to the direction, the doctrine, and the discipline of the church. Men who will model maturity and ministry to the flock. And men who will pray prayers of faith and healing for his people. That's what an elder, overseer, pastor does. And their authority is not because of a title. Their authority doesn't come from a position. Their authority comes from an open Bible. Here's what God's Word says. And an obedient life. Follow me as I follow Christ. And that is it. Well, let's pray. Father, we come before you tonight. Thank you for this time in your Word. Lord, help us to seek your face. Lord, help us to study your word. Help us, Lord, to be obedient to you and what you reveal to us through the scriptures. And Father, I pray that even now, Lord, I don't have to worry. I don't have to fret. I don't have to conjure up some creative creativity in my own mind. Lord, I know by faith in your word that your Holy Spirit is going to call the right men at the right time to do this great work. And Father, I pray that in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, don't run off. We've got a few minutes left. And come on up, Herman.